Keep It Fictional, a book podcast for book lovers by book lovers. I am your host today, Kareen. Very excited for this special episode. And I am joined today by my book friends, Sadie, Al, and Virginia. And today we are very excited to bring you four Indigenous authors uh, that we are highlighting in this month of September. Now, there is actually no such thing as an Indigenous writer. To paraphrase the great Jeanette Armstrong, who was the author of the first novel by a First Nations woman in Canada, published in 1985, which is not that long ago, she says that there isn't really Indigenous literature. There's Mohawk literature. There's Okanagan literature, there's Inu, Dene, Cree writers and literature, but there isn't just a generic pot that you can put all Indigenous writers and literature into. These are all individual nations with their own languages, style, tradition, narrative, history, mythos. And sometimes it is the mixing of one culture with the other. So we are very excited to highlight four fantastic authors from different nations, from different backgrounds, sharing their stories in anticipation of September 30th, which is National Day of Truth and Reconciliation. It's a time where we all need to take stock of our nation's history. And really, I think for a lot of people who are settlers on this land, focus on the truth part of truth and reconciliation. And one small way that you can do that is by taking some time to read or explore the story of an Indigenous author. A lot of narratives sometimes focus on Indigenous pain, but there is so much more than that. There is pain, but there is creativity and joy, and humor, and invention, and exploring brand new strange worlds in the mythos, and encountering strange things in the forest, and beautiful poetry. We are so lucky to be living in a time where there are more and more Indigenous authors or authors of Indigenous descent who are writing and being published in North America. For a long time, this would have been a very difficult podcast to do because there were so few voices being published. Again, the first novel by a First Nations woman published in Canada was in 1985. So we are very, very privileged to be in a time where so many amazing authors of Indigenous descent have fought to have their space at the table and fought to have their voices heard. So we are very, very excited Um very excited to explore, I think, actually four different genres, which is very exciting, um, and four different authors and stories. So we are going to kick it off with Sadie, who I know was so excited about this episode because they really, really liked the book that they were going to be talking about. So I'm going to hand it right over to you. Yes, I'm very, very excited to talk about this book. Um, as Kareen said, I, I loved it, and I will get into that later as well. Um, and I was telling Kareen yesterday that I don't know when I'm going to get the chance to read the sequel. This is a trilogy and I don't know when I'm going to get the chance to read the next two books. And that makes me really sad because I just want to keep reading them and keep living in this world. Uh, so the book that I am going to be talking about today is called A Broken Blade and it is by Melissa Blair. And Melissa Blair is an Anishinaabe Quay from Treaty 9 in Northern Ontario and the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe in Ottawa. Now, I don't know a lot about TikTok. I'm just going to start by saying that. I know basically nothing about TikTok, um, and I know literally nothing about book talk. But apparently, Melissa Blair is quite a prolific member of the BookTok community and actually used BookTok to help her promote this book. So this is her first book. And she, when she first published it, it was self-published. 
And so she used a kind of scavenger hunt type game that encouraged readers and fellow book talkers to post videos about the book as they followed clues to try and figure out who the author was. So she sent out uh, boxes of this book to anyone who was interested, and they got the book with the cover with no author listed. And through all of these clues and reading the book, they had to try and figure out who the author was. So that is how she used book talk in a way to promote her book and get a lot of hype um, going for it before it had officially been published. Now, before I get into uh, kind of a summary about this book, I do want to give a couple of content warnings. Um, the book does deal with self-harm, addiction, and alcoholism. And I do mention these in my summary and my review. So just if those are um, topics that are sensitive to you, um, just take care and maybe move on to the next one for this. Uh, all right. So our story follows Kira. Kira has spent the last 30 years as the king's blade, his most deadly spy and assassin. Now, you wouldn't be able to tell that she'd been spending 30 years doing this because Kira basically looks like she's in her 20s. And she probably will continue to look like she's in her 20s for a very long time. Because Kira is a halfling. She's half elf and half mortal. Now, anytime someone moves against the king, it is Kira's job to stop them permanently. And whether she agrees or not, she doesn't really have another choice. Because in the kingdom of Alvarath, Halflings are either slaves to the crown or they're killed. And things have been this way ever since the Blood Wars, when King Aemon won the crown by eradicating the race of elves who had lived on the land for millennia. Now, any halfling who isn't able to hide their elven ancestry and amber-colored blood spend their whole life either in service to the crown or on the run from the king and usually from Kira. Kira is good at her job. Very, very good. Probably the best that there is. No matter who the king asks her to track, she hunts them down, giving them no opportunity to escape. Now, she tries her best in most situations to offer mercy to any that she can. However, this mercy comes in the form of a quick painless death, not an actual pardon and the right to live. Kira tries not to think too much about the people that she's killing. She knows that most of them are her own people. And she learned a long time ago that she would never be able to save her people. And so the best that she can do is drown her hatred of herself in a flagon of wine until the king decides she's no longer useful and he kills her. But until then, she continues on because that's what she's been trained to do. And she's been trained to do this ever since she was first found as a child, abandoned. Not knowing anything about her parents or where she came from, Kira was raised in the Order. And she was raised to become a Shade. Now, the Order is a place where female halflings go and they're turned into an elite group of guards for the king. Now, if Kira thinks about it, she's really pretty lucky. She has freedom to go where she wants. She holds power and authority in her own way that really no other halfling can say. And she does do her best to use that power and freedom to help her people, even if it's in very, very small ways, and even if she is still killing them. However, these small differences are not really enough to counteract the guilt that she feels every single day of her life. The guilt that she's letting down her people, she's letting down herself, and she's letting down the one person who she ever promised anything to. A promise that to this day, more than 30 years after it is made, has still gone unfulfilled. So to assuage her guilt, Kira keeps a record of every halfling whose life she has been forced to take because of the king. Every one of her own people that she has been forced to kill. The record she keeps is scrawled across her own body, every name having been carved into her skin as a permanent mark of her guilt. Now, 
Kira's life is kind of thrown into disorder with the introduction of a new threat to the kingdom and to the king. He is known only as the shadow. And he spends his time attacking the king's shades and disrupting trade within the kingdom. This is the first time since the war that anyone has stood against the king, and he's clearly not very happy about it and refuses to let it continue happening. So with the encouragement of his very cruel and abusive son, Prince Damien, the king tells Kira that she has to go find and kill the shadow, and she won't be given a second chance if she fails. Now, Kira has only faced the shadow once, and narrowly escaped with her life, which doesn't really inspire a lot of confidence in her. However, once again, she knows she doesn't really have much of a choice. She either goes and faces the shadow and is killed by him, or she doesn't, and she fails, and the king kills her himself. So Kira begins her search, and her search brings her to the lands of the Dark Fae. Now, similar to the elves, the Dark Fae have lived on the land for millennia. However, in the aftermath of the wars, instead of being eradicated, they signed a treaty with the king, vowing to stay in their own lands and promising to turn over any elf or halfling who has tried to escape into their territory. Now, the stories that Kira has heard of the Dark Fae are absolutely terrifying. They can control people with their minds. They can turn any liquid into the most deadly poison with the blink of their eyes. Kira knows that she will most likely be killed the moment that she steps onto their land, but again, doesn't really have much choice. So she ventures into the world of the Dark Fae. When she gets there, she's a little bit shocked to find not at all what she was expecting. The first thing she notices is that halflings, fae, and elves all live happily in the fae lands. Now, she's glad to see that her people are free, uh, but she knows that the king will not be glad. And as the king's representative, she's in a very dangerous position, walking into this world that is very clearly breaking the treaty that they made with the king. Now, when she's invited to dinner at a fey lord's house, she's even more confused and approaches the knight prepared for a fight. Now, what she's not ready for is hospitality and honesty and a view of her world and her role in it that she never really thought of and that she never expected. Now, through her time in these lands, Kira is able to find the shadow and she is finally able to uncover his identity. However, once again, he is not at all what she expected. And she finds herself in a position to not only change her course in life, but maybe even fulfill the promise that she made all those years ago. Her promise to kill the king and take down the crown. I loved this book. Oh my God, I loved this book. It had all the elements that I just like absolutely adore in a book and that like every single one of them that worked to draw me into it. It had the strong, snarky protagonist. It had the kind of the slow burn enemies to lovers romance. It had magic. It had kick-ass women. It had just like all of these amazing elements to it. And, and honestly, on the surface, it it looks very much like a very typical fantasy romance, kind of akin to Sarah J. Mass or Jennifer L. Armentrout, like all of those very kind of fae-based, high-energy, strong female protagonist fantasy romances. Now you have this flawed protagonist. Uh, she's trying to cope with her life choices. Um, she doesn't know a lot about her past. At the same time, she's trying to figure out who she is. And all of these things are those same elements that are brought into any other of these kinds of books. Now, if you look a bit closer, though, you can see how well Blair uses her characters and uses her plot to shine a light and to take a really close look at colonization. And through the character of Kira, she shines a light more specifically on generational trauma and the impact of colonization and how that 
impacts a person and how that impacts a family and a people and a generation upon generation of people. Uh, Blair said that she wrote a blo broken blade after noticing that there was a gap in paranormal fantasy stories told by Indigenous authors. Um, and that through writing the book, she wanted to inform a lot of the world on what happened to First Nations people and specifically what happened to First Nations people in uh, what is known as Canada. Um, and a lot of what she includes in this book is actual historical fact that has happened in in this uh, country. And she uses her own knowledge um, of First Nations history um, and also her knowledge from working in First Nations spaces and Indigenous spaces to inform all of these plot points and all of these character traits. Um, and she said that the treaties that that have been signed in this country are also mirrored in her story and mirrored in that um, in that plot. And so she just does such a good job of kind of blending those real historical elements um, and putting them into this story that is so engaging and has such strong and broken and real characters to it. Um, you kind of get to see Kira at the beginning. She's She is extremely broken and she continues to be throughout this book because of the things that she's been asked to do. Um, and at the beginning of the book, she, she is addicted to alcohol and she can't stop drinking. And at a certain point, she realizes that this is going to be what kills her. And the way that Blair uses that um, in the story, it's, it's in a fight with the shadow and Kira realizes that she's not as good as she's supposed to be. And because of her drinking, he is able to best her and she narrowly escapes with her life. And so she makes the choice at that point to, to try and turn herself around and try and stop drinking. And you see the struggle that she goes through. You see that it's not, I think that in some stories, a character might make that choice and then they do it. And it's it doesn't focus at all on the challenge of actually giving up something that not only your mind is addicted to, but your body is addicted to. And it's not that just that mental block that you're having to go through. It's the physical need that your body is literally going into withdrawal when you when you don't have it in your body. And, and she does a really good job of of putting that into that character and explaining those situations. Um, she also said that specifically she chose fantasy because this specific genre is where uh, people can cast and see characters in their head in a very different way. Um, and so she was hoping that as an Indigenous person, she would have the opportunity to write more Indigenous characters in this fantasy genre um, that she didn't have when she was growing up. Um, yeah, and so that uh, that is my review. Uh, I would recommend this book to, I mean, to anyone, but specifically if you are a fan of fantasy, if you are a fan of Sarah J. Maas, Jennifer L. Amantraut, um, but you are wanting something that has a bit, a bit more history and a bit more backing and a bit more stakes, um, and yeah, you're wanting something with a, a more diverse cast and an indigenous um, impact on it. I would highly recommend A Broken Blade by Melissa Blair. Nice. And what's the what's the sequel called? Oh no. <laughs> You're putting me on the spot. Um a shadow Some, a shadow yeah. crown. A shadow crown. Okay. Yeah. And is the is the trilogy finished or is the third one still being written? Feb February 6, 2024. Ooh. A vicious game. A vicious game comes out. Nice. Classic, classic fantasy title. Um, but I, I do appreciate that it's not like a blank of blank and blank, which is like the epitome of fantasy titles, or at least for YA stuff. <laughs> yeah. Very fair. All right. Awesome. Thank you, Sadie. Um, we are going to swing over to Virginia. Virginia, what book do you have for us? All right. Where are you from? Seriously, where are you really from? Tell us about what life is like on the reserve. Oh, you don't speak the language? Why not? Shouldn't you just go learn it? You're not saying Niska correctly. Who are you to tell this story? These are questions that Jordan Abel gets frequently 
when he goes to writers' conferences, often as the only Indigenous person there, when he delivers lectures as a professor at universities, when he talks to friends and relatives and people who are Indigenous and not Indigenous. Jordan Abel's grandparents went to the same residential school in Chilliwack, British Columbia. He never met them. When he was an infant, his mother Catherine moved and relocated them to Ontario after the police came looking for his father who has committed a sexual assault. He met his father for the first time when he was 23. Growing up, Jordan Abel has no contact with his father's side of his family. So what does it mean for him to be an urbanized, indigenized pers indigenous person, to be a displaced, indigenous person? This is one of the many things that Abel wrestled with in his memoir, Nishka. Nishka is not a conventional book in the sense that Abel tried to reach for other formats and mediums when words are not enough to describe and to explain what his experience is. This is a book with nooks of Jordan's recollections of conversations he has had with others, events that have happened to him, photos that are often blended with other photos to produce a new image. Niska arts that are blended with texts and poems, some of this art he came across, actually done by Abel's father. Excerpts of his other works, transcripts of lectures that he has done, and court documents about his father, and notes from his mother talking about her decision to move away. Screenshots of websites about how to end one's life, morphing into photos of a residential school. Jordan Abel tries to make sense of what it means to be an Indigenous person today using all these different pieces and all these different elements. People question his Indigenous identity, and they don't realize these casual questions that are just thrown his way and the harm that they have caused to someone who feels so disconnected to his culture. He doesn't need others to question him. He questions himself all the time. He doesn't know, is he enough? Is he, what is he lacking? And when colonial violence has ripped his family apart, how can you still feel connected? Who do you turn to to learn about yourself and your family? Jordan Abel remembers when he first wants to find out a little bit more about the Niska Nation, the only book that was accessible to him that was about his family, about his culture, was a book written by a white settler. That's what he has to get to know his family. He remembers standing at the Royal British Museum looking at a totem bowl that is supposed to be from his nation, that is taken from his family, but he doesn't know what he's looking at. He remembers visiting the site of his grandparents' residential school, and suddenly it dawned on him, wait a second, I've been here before for a writing event. But yet, at that point, way back, he has no idea what land he is standing on. These feelings of isolation and loneliness are with Abel every day as a displaced, the indigenous person. And as he said, perhaps even if he has contact with his father's family, maybe he will still feel sad, he will still feel lonely, but at least he will have a context to understand why he feels so alone. This is the meaning of intergenerational trauma. When we think about residential school, we often talk about them in the past tense. It's something that occurred in history, we like to think. And Abel is here to tell us why it is important to talk about residential schools in the present tense. The trauma, the impact is very much alive in many Indigenous people today. He wants to have an answer for that relative of his who said to him, well, I know people who went to British boarding schools and yeah, it was a horrible experience, but they got over it. Why can't people who went to residential schools also get over it? This is a book that was immensely difficult for Abel to write. And 
I can't imagine the courage that it takes to confront his family story with the very little box. He talks about this small little box that his mother has. That's all he has of his relations, that he can try to make connections with his father's family. But he wants to have a book that he wishes he had in those moments of sadness, in those moments of hopelessness. He wants to feel that someone is there, someone understands. I hope you would consider picking up Jordan Abel's memoir, Niska, and many other books by him. Um, he has a new book that just came out called Empty Spaces, which is a not a retelling, but it's more like a reimagining or reframing of The Last of the Mohicans. Um, he has an award-winning poetry po uh, collection called Injun, who talks about the depiction of Indigenous people in Westerns. And there are many, many other stories worth picking up. And as Abel talked about um, in the book, I think one of the hardest pa like passage to read was when he talks about a, a job interview that he has with some professors and some students. And after he described the projects that he's been working on, after he described his life and his father, et cetera, et cetera, the interviewer asked him, yeah, but what's new about this? What's different about your story? He didn't know how to answer them at that point. But Abel said if he, they ask him now, he will say to them, nothing. This is an old, sad, painful story that hurts just as much yesterday as it does today. There's nothing new about it, but it's still not going anywhere. So again, this is Niska by Jordan Abel. Thank you, Virginia. Very, uh, very, very interesting. Um, as we are kind of only choosing four books to talk about today, our existential question kind of gives us the option to promote four other Indigenous authors. So my existential question for us today is um, what Indigenous author do you think everyone should be reading? Um, what is one that you would uh, CBC Canada Read style champion um, that everyone should pick up? Let's see. Mm, everyone's thinking very hard. Everyone's thinking very, very hard. Mm. Okay, well, I'm going to cheat on this question because <laughs> one of us has to. We always do, right? Um, because I think, as you pointed out, a lot of there's just not enough being published there is just so little and I think a lot of the offers that I am dying to read I think they're all offers that have only has one book out so far because there's more and more coming out and that's great but there's we need more so um can I like just like um, a bunch of a bunch of offers out I'm just gonna do it um so Erica T. Wirth has a, a book called White Noise um a horror novel if you're interested a crime story is Winter Counts by David Hesker Wembley Weldon uh there's Calling for Banker Dance by Oscar Holt Kia. There is a short story collection called Night of the Living Rest by Morgan Tulty. And of course, there's Bad Cree, which is the book I was going to read um, for this episode by Jessica Johns, but I didn't because um, I pick up Jordan Abel and Jordan Abel, of course, another author that I'm going to go look more into. Um, and if I have to pick one um, is and that has uh, quite a few books coming that have come out um, is the person that I think we had for a author visit one time um, when we were still doing online visit. And it was just, he just seems like the nicest, kindest person on earth. And that is Richard Van Camp. I was just, it was just like the best author visit. Just, I can listen to him all day long so yeah i'm absolutely going to piggyback on that richard van camp speaking with him and listening to him is like getting the warmest hug um he is just so wonderful and so warm and just it's such a like a very generous spirit like yeah you you just feel so warm when he speaks so yeah you should absolutely and he's got such a, a depth of material like he's written um picture books he's written graphic novels he's written fiction like he's he's done it all and it's all 
great. Um, so yes, another another full hearted recommendation for picking up or even if Richard Van Camp happens to be in your area, throw down everything you have and run um, because you know it's going to be a, a good evening. Um, as Virginia had mentioned, there there isn't there there isn't in the past a lot to choose from, but I'm going to go throw way back because I like going back to kind of like the roots of something and then seeing how that person kind of like influences everyone else. Um, and I am going to actually choose one that I have talked about on the podcast before, and that is uh, Marilyn Dumont. Uh, who wrote a really good brown girl, um, which I really, really liked. And um, because she is from like Northeast Alberta um, and I'm from Northern Alberta, like it, it just like just really connected that that sense of like place and time. And because she's such a such a hugely influential figure, it's just really amazing to kind of go back and like I, again, think of like the courage that it took to to write and to publish that book and to to be an author in that space for the first time and how amazingly influential she has been. So I, I always like to go back to kind of pull it back to see where it started. And I think I think she's a wonderful per, uh, person to start with if you're interested, if you're interested in poetry, which I know some of us are and some of us are not. I'm going to stay in my genre and uh, <laughs> recommend uh, Cherie Dimeline, who wrote The Merrill Thieves. Um, and then uh, one of her more recent books, Venko, as well, which I have not read yet, but it is on my list to read. Um, and then this one um, is not, uh, uh, she, she is lives in New Mexico, I believe. Um, so we, I couldn't champion her on Canada Reads, but uh, Rebecca Roanhorse um, is another that I would highly recommend. She wrote The Trail of Lightning. Uh, series, which is kind of a post-apocalyptic uh, world where um, indigenous uh, mythology and gods and heroes of legends come have come back in this sort of post-apocalyptic world. Um, and then also she wrote The Black Sun, um, which was inspired by the civilizations of pre-Columbian Americas. Uh, I've only read Trail of Lightning by her, um, but I would highly recommend that one. And I, I would love to read more of her books. Um, and then I actually mentioned this author on our um, art episode, uh, but Roy Henry Vickers, who uh, he's an artist and he does children's books, um, board books and picture books, but also um, books that kind of tie in um, Indigenous mythology and First Nations uh, stories and things like that. Um, so I would highly recommend him as well. All right. Well, if I have to pick an author who isn't the one that I picked a book for today. Um, I'm going to have to pick Eden Robinson. Um, Eden Robinson is a British Columbia author, so we're representing a local author, and she's written some fantastic novels, my favorite of which would be her Trickster trilogy. Um, Son of a Trickster is the first one, then Trickster Drift and Return of the Trickster. They're just a fantastic look at sort of bringing Indigenous mythology and some sort of speculative fiction vibes into uh, modern day. And really highly recommend uh, picking up anything by Eden Robinson. Splendid. All right. So again, we've always got to cheat a little and sneak a couple more authors in there, um, especially when we have such a broad topic like this. It's really hard just to choose one. Um, but I did choose one book, um, which I'm very, very excited to talk about. Um, and it is Manny Kanatish, and I'm absolutely pronouncing that incorrectly, um, by Naomi Fontaine and translated by Louise von Flotto. Von Flotto. I think it's German, so I'm putting a little bit of a German sting on that, but I don't think that's correct. Um, so Manny Kanatish is named for Little Marguerite. So it was the small one room school housed on the Uashat Reserve on Quebec's North Shore. It was named after a very small, slight, unassuming woman who taught generations. But as the population grew in Uashat, the one-room school was not enough. So they built another one. And then that was not enough. 
So they built another one. As the population grows to about 5,000 people, there are three schools in this particular area. As our narrator says, mostly taught by white women, some Inu, teaching all of the children there. Most of them speak French. Some speak only Inu. Some have learned too. But Yami, who is our narrator, didn't attend these schools. When she was eight, her mother packed up everything that they belonged, drove eight hours down Route 138 into the Quebec that belonged to the white people. Everyone knows this road, everyone knows this route and the things that they see, the churches that they see on the corner, the signs that they pass. But those eight hours might as well be an entirely different world. Yami grew up sticking out and simultaneously trying to hide. She was the one Inu child in a white school and grew up saved and loving books. She loved books and she got her education in French literature. But when she graduates with her education degree, she's a little afraid that she's going to spend all of the time washing dishes in a restaurant because the economy is so bad. And so lured by the opportunity for a job and, again, smoother hands, um, she decides to go back to Uashat to teach. Now, as she says, she doesn't want to teach the little kids. She says she doesn't have the patience or discipline to tell stories about frogs, which I think is such a wonderful line. She instead decides to teach high schoolers. Now, these students are only a few years younger than her. She has never taught before. She's heard that these students are hard, undisciplined, unruly. But as she gets there, she realizes that they're also full of dreams and disappointments and connections. But even though they're so similar in some ways, she still feels this disconnect between them. The disconnect of their history, the disconnect of their experience, the different worlds that they have grew up in. In one of her classes, one of the students asks, oh, is this your uncle? She says, well, yes. Oh, well, then you're my cousin. And she didn't even know that she was teaching family this entire time. Those eight hours between Uatash and Quebec are a different world. She really wants to connect with these students to help them, to help them succeed, but she doesn't know how to do it. She's distant from their lives and she's distant from herself. There is a wonderful passage that I really, really liked where she says, in the beginning, I'd hoped to make friends with my colleagues, but it seems they already have full, well-organized life, and what little time they have left to socialize is for a brief get-together every third Friday of the month from five to seven. This solitude is not like me. I used to love organizing big dinner parties, inviting friends and friends of friends. I've turned into a bear. Nobody comes near a bear. Yami feels isolated, alone, disconnected, and unmoored. And this collection follows her throughout the school year that is full of love and loss and triumph and disappointments. As she becomes closer to her students and she comes closer to kind of finding her own peace with her place in the world. I will say that this book does... Um, does deal with this uh, suicide of one of the students. So even though this this seems like a light story, it is really dealing with a lot of issues faced by people um, in the Indigenous community. And so that is just something to be aware of when you approach this book. And 
it is a wonderful, heartfelt love letter to teaching and to her community. Yami, the main character, is so wonderfully sympathetic. She's like a a wine drinking Anne of Green Gables. Um, her heart is so big, and her life is such a mess. <laughs> And she's making a lot of choices, but you just want to take her to your heart and say, oh, Yami, please don't sleep with Stanley anymore. He's a loser and who doesn't have a driver's license. This is just going to end poorly. Um, it's kind of divided into small little vignettes or snapshots or kind of like tones. Um, it has such it's it's a wonderfully, uh, wonderful love letter. Um that has like little snapshots throughout the school year and you learn the individual lives of the students as they grow and they change and how she is changed by them. Um, Again, not to kind of draw a very weird uh, line, but it really does feel like the Anne of Green Gables part where she becomes a teacher and then like involves herself in the lives of her students. So weirdly, I'm going to say it's a little bit of like Anna Green Gables meets Queenie, if you've read that, uh, which is like the self-destructive spiral of someone, but in a really beautiful, heartwarming way. Um, so Naomi Fontaine is from the Inu Nation of Uachet. Uh, She graduated from the University of uh, Laval and then actually did go back to Uachet to teach. And so you do get the sense that this book is very autobiographical, um, that is very much pulled from her own experiences as a teacher of high schoolers. Um, it was shortlisted for the Governor General's Award for French Literature, um, as well as many others. And you you absolutely understand why as you read it. Um, she has said that she wanted to write a story about the Inu people as individuals. Um, she said that often Inu people get reduced to a statistic. And so the statistic of teen pregnancies or the graduation statistic or even that of suicide. And she wanted to kind of tear off that I, that that generalization, that stereotyping of her own people and kind of show them as individuals and their individual stories beyond a number that you might read in a newspaper. And I think she does such a wonderful job of this in this book. Um, you really do get to know all of the students, some of whom you kind of hate at the beginning and then slowly you understand what they're all about. And then they do a school play and it's just, no, it's everything. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that Naomi Fontaine, um, she's she's very young. This is her second book, her first book. Um, Kuesipan was actually made into a film. Um, and her third was a uh, Shuni, which was a finalist for the Governor General's Literary Award. So she is someone who I'm absolutely going to go back, read the other book, going to go forward and read the new book. Um, I think she's such a wonderfully talented young writer. Um, and I think that this is a, a a beautiful portrayal of kind of community and, and a character that you just kind of want to like take on your couch and give her just like a big hug and say, well, it, it could be worse. Yeah, it could be worse. You're going to figure it out. You'll figure it out in the end um, with kind of just like wonderful, wonderful writing and so much heart. Um, she dedicated this book to her students and you can you can see that she is just a, a born educator and a born writer. Um, so if you're looking for something kind of a, a beautiful portrayal of community and a, a love letter to to the transformative power of community and students and looking for something with just like a lot of heart, um, then I would absolutely recommend picking up this this absolute gem of a novel, uh, Manika, Manika Tish, uh by the fantastic Naomi Fontaine. All right. Well, Al, you didn't get to talk about this author in our like cheating question of recommend more authors. So I am curious as to to who is this author that that you would like to recommend to us? All right. So I picked an author today whose this book has won the Bram Stoker Award for novel, the Shirley Jackson Award for novel, the Ray Bradbury Prize for science fiction, fantasy, and speculative fiction. This is a 
well-honored book and it is a horror novel so we're going a bit darker than some of the other ones in today's uh show before i do my summary i would like to give a warning for animal death um if that is something that bothers you maybe skip ahead or skip this review um today i'm going to be talking about the only good indians by stephen graham jones we open with Ricky Boss Ribs in a bar in North Dakota, having a beer and admiring the blonde waitress while he unwinds from his work on the oil drilling crew. He left the reservation after his brother overdosed and is planning on getting to Minnesota, where he knows some guys, and starting up a new life. For now, though, he's working on the oil rig to get enough money in his pocket to get him to Minneapolis. Unfortunately, he's not going to get there. Needing to go number one, but not willing to brave the long line for the bathroom, Ricky goes outside to find somewhere to do his business. It's while he's out in the parking lot that he sees it. An elk, clambering over the trucks as if it's drunk, setting off alarms. It seems like it's coming towards him, and Ricky finds a crescent wrench nearby. He waits for it to come, swings, and sends the wrench into the side mirror of a truck. That's when he turns around to see a group of white guys coming towards him, looking none too pleased at the property damage. And when he turns back to gesture to the elk to show his reasoning, it's gone, like it never was. Ricky runs, and he's fast, but he's not fast enough. He almost gets away. It seems like he will, like he's going to get to an open field and run away free from these men who want to hurt him. But suddenly, somehow, there's a herd of elk blocking his path, and another herd of men crashing up behind him. Indian man killed in dispute outside bar. That's one way to say it. Next, we meet Lewis. Lewis left the res years ago and is living with his white girlfriend, Pita, in the house they're hoping to live in for a long while. He's trying to fix a light that keeps flickering for no apparent reason, hoping he can get it done before Pita gets home as a surprise for her. He hasn't turned off the ceiling fan, which is kind of dumb, but he's pretty sure he'll be fine. As he's working on the light, though, he happens to look down through the spinning blades, and he sees a young cow elk lying on her side, dead. In that moment, he's transported back in time ten years, to a snowy day just before Thanksgiving, when he and his friends Ricky, Gabe, and Cass we're out hunting for the last time that year, trying to catch some elk. They were in the section reserved for the elders, somewhere they weren't supposed to be, especially not with Cass's truck. But it's the last day of the season, for them at least, and the snow's heavy, and Gabe knows these back roads like the back of his hand. And aren't they owed a try at catching something to fill their empty freezers? And luck seems to be on their side, because as the truck chugs over a ridge they see a whole herd of elk somehow managing not to hear or smell the approaching humans desperately trying to eat what's left of the grass before it's all covered under the snow lewis and his friends roll out of the truck their rifles ready and they shoot the elk panic but they panic up the ridge towards the hunters and by the time the herd has enough savvy to turn around the other way lewis and the crew have taken down nine elk Nine whole elk, probably 500 pounds each. No way they can fit all that onto the back of the half-ton truck. It's while they're field dressing the elk, getting ready to take what they can manage, that Lewis finds her. A young cow elk, bullet through her back that's taken out her hind legs, but she scrabbles back to life. Lewis panics, manages to pull out his rifle and try to put her out of her misery. A second bullet doesn't take even though it takes out half of her head, but the third does. And when he goes to field dress her, her milk bags fall out, and Lewis realizes that she was pregnant, further along than she should be for this time of year. He buries the calf fetus and promises the young she-elk that all of her will be used. Nothing will go to waste. But why is this memory coming back now, ten years later? Why is Lewis seeing the elk, or sometimes an elk-headed woman, and what does she want? This book follows four young Blackfeet men, all of whom are being chased by their guilt, their history, 
and the culture and traditions they left behind. The horror here is sometimes atmospheric and occasionally quite bloody and very effective. Jones has a gift for building tension with flashes of things that may or may not be there that builds to explosions of violence, which can be shocking. I loved this book, the slow way it builds the horror and the way it builds towards its fantastic ending. Jones manages to weave together the stories that the four leads in a very compelling way, focusing on one at a time, and in the end, giving us a wonderful final girl, as they're called in the slasher genre. This is a story about guilt and revenge and whether it's possible to break that cycle. Besides the horror and gore, this is a story about modern Indigenous life and the ways in which old traditions collide with modern culture. It's a story about that questions what Indigenous identity means in the modern world and the ways in which things you may have left behind can continue to have profound effects on you years down the line. You need to have a stomach for horror and gore to read this book, but if you do, if you enjoy the horror genre and want to pick up something that'll be a little bit different with an almost poetic tone at times, I highly recommend The Only Good Indians by Stephen Graham Jones. I mean, just look at that cover. I love the design of the cover with the words cradled in the elk's antlers, the scrawled a novel at the bottom. It's fantastic. All right. Thank you so much, Al. Um, and before we head out or finish this podcast, Sadie just has a little plug for some authors that are going to be visiting the library soon. I do. So we have two wonderful Indigenous performers who are going to be coming in, um, one in September, one in October. And uh, they are uh, free programs. Uh, you do have to register on the website, but um, they're more than um, more than enough room for for anyone who would like to attend them. Uh, the first one we have is an indigenous story, indigenous storytelling event with uh, Red Buffalo Nova Wipert, and they um, use film and hoops to kind of tell their story. Um, and then uh, that one is on September twenty eighth. It's a Thursday night from seven to eight p.m. in the Inlet Theater. And then we have uh, author Eden Fine Day, uh, who's going to be coming in on October eighteenth. Um, 7 to 8.30, that's a Wednesday night, uh, to do some readings um, from her upcoming books and to do a bit of a Q&A um, surrounding that as well. Uh, so hopefully uh, you come are able to come out and uh, attend one or both of the presentations. I'm really looking forward to them. And I think they're going to be absolutely wonderful. Thank you, Sadie. Uh, so this coming September 30th uh, is National Day of Truth and Reconciliation, but it started as Orange Shirt Day. So this was a personal um, grassroots Indigenous-led uh, program by Phyllis Webstadt, who went to the St. Joseph Mission near Williams Lake. So when we wear that orange shirt, um, that has been co-opted by a lot of corporations. Um, I think that every time you see that, it is actually meant to be a symbol of, of so much more. It's meant to be a symbol of the stripping away of the culture, freedom, and self-esteem of Indigenous children. The day coming up is to recognize the legacy of residential schools, the missing children, and the survivors. And if there is a survivor that you know of in your family, or if you are, um, the residential, the Indian Residential School Survivors Hotline um, is toll free and available at 1-800-721-0066. And this is also a wonderful organization, an Indigenous organization that is working with um, residential school survivors. So wearing the shirt is is not enough. So there were 140 federally run residential schools in Canada that ran from 1867 until 1996. So again, as I think one of our other people mentioned that we tend to think of it as a historical event, but it is very, very, very present. Um, the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission ran from 2008 until 2015 and interviewed and talked with people who were directly or indirectly impacted by residential schools. From this, they came up with 94 calls to action. 
So when we talk about reconciliation, and oftentimes we feel a little bit hopeless or powerless to do something, or we ask, what can we do to help? Those 94 calls to action were directly told to us of what we could do. As of yet, depending on what source you look at, only 13 of those have actually been fulfilled. 13 of 94. So as we approach September 30th, there are things that we can do as individuals, but there are also things that we need to hold our own government accountable for. And those are the 94 calls to action. So on this day, as hopefully you are many days um, celebrating Indigenous authors and Indigenous voices, you can take some time to look through those 94 calls to action and perhaps bring to the attention of our representatives in the government that these are still there, they're still important, and they are as of yet unfulfilled. So Thank you so much for the time and space for us to talk about some wonderful books um, that we want to recommend to you. As we say with any episode that is highlighting uh, a particular area or particular voices, um, this is not just something that you can keep to September. Uh, you can be picking up Indigenous voices uh, every month of the year in all genres or even genres that they are making themselves. Um, and so we are so lucky to have the opportunity to have more voices and more stories at the table. And we should be cognizant and thoughtfully reading them. So thank you so much, everyone, uh, for joining us for this episode and happy reading. Mm -hmm.